All right, I see the Zoom room is starting to fill up with our guests. Welcome to the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. We'll be getting started here in just a minute or two. As always, we want to know who you are and where you're from. Drop that information in the chat box at the bottom of your Zoom video window. If you are watching on Facebook Live, go ahead and let us know who you are and where you're from in the comments today. We have a great program lined up. Jonathan Kramer is with us. He is an artist, an inventor, and the sculptor of the We Are statue. And so we look forward to passing the story of the We Are statue and the artist behind it on to you today on Coffee Hour. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll be getting started here in just a minute. I see Don Lenz is joining us from Arts and Architecture, and more importantly, as he puts it, a friend of Jonathan Kramer's. And so, Don, good to see you here as always, and thanks for your support of Coffee Hour. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? Good morning, I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and welcome to the Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. Each week on Coffee Hour, you can expect to hear the voices of Penn Staters talking about what they're passionate about. And you can expect to feel the pride and the power of the Penn State Network. As a reminder, we are recording this session and closed captions are available for this event. You can find the information in the chat in Zoom or in the comments on Facebook. Well, today we're joined by Jonathan Kramer. Jonathan grew up in Washington State and in Pennsylvania. He graduated from Penn State with a BFA in 1994 and soon moved to New York to eke out a career as a painter and sculptor. He made a discovery in geometry through his painting around 20 years ago and has been developing as the shape matrix system since then. He's been awarded several patents to date, and uh, as we all know, he is the sculptor of the 2013 class gift, the We Are statue. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jonathan Kramer to Coffee Hour. Jonathan, good morning. Good morning. Jonathan, let's start right at the very beginning. How did you become a Penn Stater? Well, at the time I was going to State College Area High School, and you know the presence of uh, Penn State University. My family lived there. It was very strong, so it was a pretty much um, it, it was kind of a no brainer. It was like, of course, I'm going to Penn State. Then I just had to get in, and uh, that happened. And I was on my way, trying to figure out, you know, like a lot of young students, um, what I wanted to do. I didn't start with with art. I just got, it was general studies and some science classes and things, but. That's that's how it started. Jonathan, what were some of the things that you were involved in at Penn State or some of your favorite memories from your time on campus? Actually, before I got into the studio, the Bachelor of Fine Art program, I, I took some science classes and things like that. Um, I remember uh, Professor James Wood's uh, biological anthrop anthropology class was super inspiring. Just to start having my mind open to what a university has to offer with just the different kinds of quality classes I could take. It just, it was just um, amazing to start learning about things like that or my African art history classes on um, my work with Helen O'Leary, the uh, great um, painter at Penn State. I just started learning really. And um, those, those were the moments more, more so than the, like a football game or whatever that really kind of pushed me forward. And also the surrounding area in State College is so beautiful. I would always go into the mountains and um, absorb nature and things like that. It was, those were the highlights really for me. Well, and the mountains and nature remain part of what you're passionate about, right? You're living there in, in New York and in, um, in the Catskills. Uh, Absolutely. That, that's something that you've, that environment is something you've maintained. 
Absolutely. I, I've been in New York for so long. Uh, recently, I moved with my family into the Catskill Mountains. Um, and like the mountains in Pennsylvania, they're from the same Appalachian chain and just wonderful. Good uh, to be able to see hawks and bald eagles and yeah. just how nature is just the power of nature. Um, you're reminded about uh, living things beyond yourself. And um, those are the greatest um, continuing education I can think of. Now, we, we said in the opening that you have eked out a career as an artist. I think that's uh, a little bit understating it. Walk us through your career, which has been prolific between graduation and the time that you, right up to the time when you learned about the We Are Statue contest. Well, <clears throat> it's a it's a pretty long story and you're not wrong saying eking out because in the beginning when you go to New York City it's so it's giant you're unknown um and you just have to make it you know uh, you you I was living underneath paintings that were drawing on Broadway at a studio on 474 Broadway in Soho at the time which was not fancy I mean you could still get your car broken in down there and um it was just like it literally sometimes, you know, it's tough. You have this painting, you're working on a painting and people are like, what are you doing with your life? Watching, watching the paint dry. And it's like, yeah. And um, you're hoping that maybe, you know, you can convince somebody to take a look at the painting and, and, and maybe you can pay your rent or buy a bag of rice or something. So it really was this period of time where when you have total dedication to the craft, um, you know, the rest of life kind of wells up around you and froths up and it's tough, like any other story of an artist like that. I mean, but then I did start, I would work on paintings for such a long period of time. Sometimes paintings would take me a year to complete. And I think some of the collectors started to see my dedication. Um, Jim and Barbara Palmer from the Palmer Museum actually came to visit me and were one of my early collectors. Um, <clears throat> there's a pencil drawing um, that they were interested in. It's at Iowa State University right now in the engineering department. And it, it's 10 feet long. And I was, you know, almost manically working on it. There's like cities that are in the, the size of a thumbnail. And, and um, you know, it was just through a lot of dedication. Um, and then finally, I started to get some sculpture um, commissions around 2004. And I had to move from that studio in Manhattan um, to a place where I could weld and shape metal. And um, so we moved to, I moved to Brooklyn and started my metal shop. And um, then I went, I made my first um, sculpture in, in Providence, Rhode Island. And then we had another one in, um, in New Jersey. And then in 2007, a shape matrix sculpture at 111 Central Park North, right, in, right at the top of Central Park. Uh, that was a pretty big deal. I was still quite young to be able, I didn't have um, a giant team around me. You know, I've always worked with a very small team um, and um, I had to shut the street down. Um, it was really intense um, to be able to just like go from acquiring materials, completely fabricating it. A lot of, a lot of artists that make public sculpture these days usually have, uh, you know, there's teams of other people making them. And at that point I was, you know, I was just making it all with a, one, a, one or two other people. I either, I, I literally had to get my friends to come around and be flag people to shut down Central Park North, you know, when, so the trucks could come and deliver the sculpture. So it was, a lot of the early sculptures were just, uh, my, my mind was just totally, um, I, I really didn't, I almost, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't like, I see, you know, I, it, I was just nervous to try to get it up. It was just such a intense thing to be able to put a sculpture up. I don't think people think about this very often. It's like, if you do, if you're doing music or something, you get on stage, you sing a song, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, you get off stage, you, you sing another song, you put a permanent sculpture. Man, if people don't like that thing, that's like a bad song that won't stop playing <clears throat> forever. <laughs> So you, you try to like not, you try to not think about that, but that weight is there. And I remember when the final, finally it was set and we knew that sculpture in Central Park would be good, but it was cool. You know, even though I hadn't really worked with a lot of galleries, the MoMA actually threw a party. Um, and that was cool. A thousand people came and Yost Fani Terry, the great um, saxophone player played. And that was cool. There's really great moments. 
that I'm such kind of a workaholic kind of person that I, I always, I just remember just a blur of intense work. If that answers your question. This is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. This morning, we're joined by Jonathan Kramer. He's an artist, an inventor, and the sculptor of the We Are statue. So Jonathan, take us back to when you first heard about the class gift contest for a piece of art that personifies the We Are spirit. What were your initial thoughts? Well, honestly, <clears throat> I think my head was in... Um... My head was, in, I was in, I was working on inventions or something. Sometimes people have to like kind of knock on my door and, and, and say, Hey, pay attention to this. And one of those people was Barbara Palmer. Um, she called me and was just like, this is a great opportunity, great project. You know, it's, it's a, um, it's, it's a competition. Um, and she's like, and she said, you know, I, I think you should consider looking into this. So it was really Barbara who was like, uh, Barbara Palmer is like, Jonathan can check this out. Please, please look at it. So I did. And I thought it was really cool. Like interesting part of the uh, crossroads with a legacy with Penn state and the history. And, and when I really um, looked more into the history, it wasn't just the piece of art the piece of art had to match the fabric and the emotion of what was going on with what a challenging right. challenging challenging artistic and social um job really you know not beyond my expression um this had to work and it had to work for penn staters and it had to work for future penn staters and we had to see ourselves in it you know um it was um a huge challenge um so that inspired me I was like, this is a big channel. I, I want to try this. So I was thrilled when um, when the design was accepted. And then for me, it was just, okay, get to work. How do I, first it was like, well, we only want to use one inch stainless steel. And then I was like, it needs to be thick. It can't be hollow. It has to be solid. I was like, this thing has to be so strong. You can, you literally, I, you literally can balance a 747 on the thing and it won't bend. I was like, the next time we win the national championship, when there's a thousand students on that thing, I just, I wanted it to be something that could last the elements in Pennsylvania and, and be touched and, 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 and stay beautiful with the attention, the physical attention around it. And you know? so it was yeah. a big challenge. The polishing took six months. It was hand polished. And that's the only way you get a polish to last long like that. It's not chrome dipped or anything. Literally six months of sanding. Jonathan, what was the artistic process like? Uh, take us through the, the selection of, of materials um, because th there was there's an awful lot of thought and detail that went into the materials, the the stone that you used to to place it on. Uh, there's oh absolutely no detail was was left untouched. Yes, I wanted to have this. I wanted it to be stainless steel because most most of my sculptures are stainless steel, other than like the blacksmithing hand forging steel sculptures that I do. But stainless steel, fantastic material, um, environmental, something that never needs to be painted. If you work on it, and get this. Um, I wanted Penn Staters to be able to see themselves in the sculpture because of the design of the sculpture. I am, um, you know, it reflecting on itself, creating abstraction, creating possibility as, as well as a focus statement as we know we are. Um, and I also wanted this, I wanted the sculptures materials to be from Pennsylvania, okay? You know, Penn State has a great history with, with as a state school, it's really kind of important. Um, so I went to a company, a Pennsylvania company called Allegheny Technologies and asked for their help to create some, they make some of the best alloys in stainless steel in the entire world. And I said, listen, and luckily some of those guys were Penn Staters. And I said, I want to make this thing two inch thick, solid stainless steel. Can you, can you help me? And they said, yes. And we actually made the steel together, the big pieces of steel together right there in Pennsylvania, close to, um, close to Pittsburgh. And then the stone, it was like, okay, well, of course we have to find a quarry in Pennsylvania for the stone. And um, it, it was just, I wanted there to be a sense of home 
And you got to have that also, I think, in an, in, in an unsaid, there's a, there's a feeling, okay? And when these materials come from our home here in Pennsylvania, um, that it has an, a power that is an unspoken power that's a positive energy that's connected to the what, what we try to achieve as a university, you know, inclusiveness. You know, like look at the resources that we have here, and and you know, in that sense, I wanted to leave no stone unturned to have a connection with the sculpture to the state of Pennsylvania and the school that we love. Jonathan, the, your connection to the project um, even became deeper when you started to do research on what we are actually meant and the the origins of of we are. Can you talk a little bit about that inspiration and and uh, and your kind of Wally triplet inspiration? Yeah, you know, it's like with art pieces, you have to, lives inspire you, whether it's your life, some experience that you've seen. Um, they, Cause the, making this sculpture was, I mean, it was really hard. I mean, it almost killed me a couple of times. I mean, seriously. And um, you think about other people's stories of it. The fact that it was connected to Wally Triplett's story um, was so powerful for me. It didn't allow me to have any, I, 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 there was no whining. It was like, if Wally Triplett could be the person that he was, then I better get the sculpture done. And if I get to actually, if he could actually see it, that was who I wanted to show it to because I knew if he liked it and if he felt comfortable with it, then it would ever would there be a good chance other people would like it too, you know. <laughs> so I got a chance to spend some time with him and um, have some dinner, and um, I was impressed by him um, in such a profound way. You know, his strength, his poise, um, his professionalism. You know, you could just. It's such an honor to be able to spend a time spend time with a legend like that, an icon. It was speaking inspiring. Of, speaking of legends and icons, right? I think uh, as I walk around campus, I think of the iconic pieces, right? And the, our our campus is um, full of them, right? Uh, but your name now is among Heinz Warnicke, who sculpted the Lion Shrine, and mm -hmm. Henry Varner Poor, who painted the uh, land grant frescoes. How does it make you feel that one of the most iconic landmarks at your alma mater was something that was produced by you? You know, um, <clears throat> that's kind of a personal question and I understand it, but you know, so I'm gonna answer it in a personal way. I, I, feel, um, I feel, of course, very honored, but there's this way at Penn State you know, it's like, if you have the capability to, to, to be better, to help other people, to create an environment that's, a, that I keep saying that's an inclusive and growing, there's, there's a wonderful um, history to what even a university is. It's more of an honor to be a part of that, a building block, instead of seeing myself in a line with, with um, these people that I've created. For me, when I walked through uh, campus, there's always a texture of everyone's contributions. And that's coming from one of the great landmarks that you talked about to one of the groundskeepers that has dedicated their lives to making look these trees that we don't even like, wow. Right. You know, every, every part of this campus is really a great work of art that works together. So to be a part of that is I think great in the way that that's, that's more of the greatness rather than the individual aspect of it. To be a part of that is, is amazing. And to see how it, it's broad and how you can be a part of that, even if you don't make a big sculpture, just by being a good student or good faculty or, 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 or standing up for what we all believe in, you know? So I, I really, that's kind of how I think about it. I, 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 sh I, I literally shy away um, from, from the other way of thinking about it because it, unless I could use that to um, help people like today with this, right. you, know, I, you know, then of course, so. Yeah, uh, 
it's well, let's talk it's about that. awesome let's... you know but you know i i try to keep it real well look that's the jonathan that's the quintessential penn stater answer right there right it's it's all about what we can all to all do together right it's it's we play all or we play none yeah we it's, don't have our names on our, and our shirt. Are means, right yep Absolutely. You, you know, you alluded to this, but I want you to talk a little bit more about how you've actually used the We Are statute to help people. There's this new partnership that you've developed with the development office and with the Barnes and Noble bookstore that allows people to have that We Are statue in their homes. Can you talk a little bit more about that project? That was almost harder than making the big one. I mean, it, it, I mean, I had to figure out, I wanted to use the same material. Nowadays, it's seven inches tall. It's a replica of the sculpture. It has the same stone that comes from the same quarry um, that they that we use for the big, it's got the stainless steel. It's just two materials. It was difficult these days where, where you can make all kinds of little things with many different processes and paint them and coat them. I wanted to keep the small one um, true. And um, it took forever to figure out actually how to engineer it, um, actually how to put it together, stick it in the stone, keep. Um, and so there's um, it's just an awesome opportunity. The, in the beginning of selling the sculpture to the community, um, and we're using it um, a lot, most of the proceeds to um, help um, help Penn Staters, you know, get through um, tough times, as you can see in the in the program, if you look at some of the information behind it. So we working with the Alumni Association and Barnes and Noble to actually, you know, provide an opportunity for Penn Staters to help Penn Staters. Um, and then and there should be more incantations of the We Are sculpture and things like that coming out in the years ahead. But right now, for the first thing that you could you could obtain um, to have for yourself, it will be a, um, you, you can't have it unless you give as well, you know, right. meaning, you know, there, there, so it's, uh, it was, it was tough, but it's, but it is tough. I mean, like the, the, the little sculpture is quite strong too. <laughs> I, I, absolutely. I've, I've seen them. I've held them. Um, they are, they are substantial. Uh, but what I think is the most substantial piece of that is that about 60% of the proceeds from the sales of these go directly to the student emergency fund that was set up. Um, I see that Don Lenz has put the uh, link to the Penn State news story in the chat if people are interested in seeing that. But again, it's just a, it's another way that you have leveraged this great piece of art to help other people. Uh, and, and it truly is almost over $900,000 has been raised in the for the student emergency fund that have helped students deal with COVID-19 um, that have helped people deal with COVID-19 and so uh, this is just contributing I, to those funds that are raised. Oh yeah I'm Paul I'm glad that you mentioned it because I, I would like things you know one of the great creative aspects of Penn State is that we find ways to give you know create programs you know um, and I would love for the legacy of this sculpture to be a part of the legacy of Penn State giving. And then I want people to come up with tons of ways to help others. And if they need the use of the sculpture, just just give me a call. Just give Penn State a call. And we're gonna we're gonna try to combine this sculpture's legacy into the legacy of giving at Penn State for sure. Absolutely. And and the legacy continues. I'm sitting here in my phone, I'm getting text messages. Uh, of people sending me pictures of them on the We Are statue. Uh, and, and so that that legacy endures. It's going to endure for generations because of the the way that you have built it. Uh, it is going to be the, um, you know, next to the Lion Shrine, right? It is it is the place that people want to go and, and stick their head through the Wii and make sure that they're in the picture. I've seen family yeah. photos. I've, it's it's amazing um, what this has what this has become. I wanted it to become, I wanted it to be our sculpture. You know, when you ask me the question, it's not, I don't even think it's of it as mine. I think of it as if it works, then it's ours. You know, there's the big, like, are people gonna like it? And like, right. it seems like people like it. Okay, it's ours. It's our sculpture, which I love. The people John enjoying it. Jonathan, you are known for the shape matrix system. Can you tell us a little bit about that? and? 
and how you develop that. I, that's it's what your art has become known for. Um, well, it hasn't really been exposed totally. I'm, I'll, I'll touch on it. It's quite deep yeah. and there's, I can't really speak totally about it, but right. in simplicity, um, I created a new encoding system, kind of like binary or like the Morris code, but I used right. shapes. I created a machine that there's a patent out there called the shape matrix geometric instrument. And basically what it does is it uses the eight basic three-dimensional shapes like cones or spheres or cubes. And I, and I, I wanted to work with these because I realized that in the, in the globe, we, for the whole world in the future, we're going to need language systems and ways of communicating that are go beyond cultural boundaries and even formal languages. So no one's going to fight a war over what, what a cube is or what a cone is, or, you know, the colors of the rainbow. I mean, those are just human. So I said, how could I use these shapes and um, basically slice them up and put them in a mechanism so they can recombine into a lot of unique identifiers? So I built a machine where if you mix it up and permute it and rotate it, you can have things like fully three-dimensional um, shape combinations, whereas if you had um, like a sphere and a cone, well, this could mix up the sphere and the cone and the donut and other shapes. So you could have a shape that's a combination of small pieces of other shapes. And that is achieved by rotating um, the cubes and permuting the cubes of a machine. You get a product shape. But what's interesting is, is that when I started to do the math on it, um, because these shapes I did, I built in geometry. So you see a shape and you see a color, but there is a complete numerical connection to the combination. So it's like every shape combination is really a, um, uh, you know, a, a, an algebraic function, a matrix function. So you can convert it into all of the, um, you know, formal languages. Also, I, I, I figured out how to flatten it out so you can scan it um, like a QR code. So when I started to do the math, I realized there was 14 quintillion combinations that this machine made. And I didn't believe it myself. I was, I'm just like, oh man, this is just an art machine. I never really tried to create some kind of new encoding system. So um, the head of physics at Penn State, Peter Mitsaros, the great um, physicist, who also a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study um, over there in Princeton, where um, Freeman Dyson was a few years ago, Einstein. So they invited me to show the machine. And I actually got to show Peter and I got uh, Dr. Mitsaros and I actually got to show Freeman Dyson, uh, which was, in, he was um, Einstein's quantum physicist. And, I, and they just said, they valid, they said, you know, the numbers are right. I mean, it does make this many combinations and I couldn't believe it. Um, so instead of, you know, staying in an academic sense and I'm not formally a physicist or anything, I went out to try to start working on the patents myself. I remember writing on a patent the day I was installing the We Are Sculpture, my first patent. So it's a real machine patent, you know, it's not, uh, it's, it's um, these patents are 150 pages long and they describe how to encode other information, passwords, all kinds of things into these shape combinations. So I figure we have such problems with the supply chain and identity theft and all of this stuff that maybe I can create the root of a technology that can be developed to help um, people um, have live more secure lives to secure supply chains um, and then started working actually with um, Dr. Tim Simpson um, at the um, engineering department and um, the SIM 3D lab who uh, what a great friend and brilliant person um, and we have worked with um, material science and 3D printing these these scannable tags and so I just kept on working with Penn State in even in, in an engineering and scientific way um, to be able to feel like I can do that, I mean, I don't have formal training in mathematics and physics, but the university setting when I was when I, when I was young was like I could take this science class and I can also take a class on how to grow grass. I mean, why why can't I? I I, I just didn't know enough to know that I couldn't develop something or invent something. I it, honestly, it came out of the art. It came out of painting, my paintings and sculpture, and I noticed 
an algorithmic function. And then since I could work on the computer and do do engineering um, CAD work on the computer, I kind of start to be able to look at it more and analyze it more of a, a numerical aspect of it and noticed an algorithm basically that I think could help people. Well, so that's, that's, it's fascinating. John, we'll see where it goes, to... but it's a long, it's a long haul. Paul. Yeah. Fascinating. If people want to find more information about that, um, is there a website we could share? Uh, right now there is, um, it's kind of dry, but there's, there, it's a more informational. It's shapematrix.com. Okay. Excellent. We will drop that in the chat as well and share that with everyone. Um, Jonathan, we have a, a short video that we want to share. Um, that that really we think personifies um, the we are the we are statue in the process. So we are going to show that to our guests. Can I mention right one thing? Yeah, um, go right before ahead. you do that. Uh, yeah, the person that produced that video, Maura Mann, who actually is one of the most powerful women in all of sports, she produced the ESPYS. She made the NFL honors. She passed away this year, so I just want to give her some respect. We got have her to thank for that movie. Absolutely. Well, it appears that that does not want to work. Uh, but Carly, if you could drop the link uh, for that video into the chat box as well so that people um, can go out. It, it's an ESPN 30 for 30 short. Um, we had a, a three minute clip that we were going to show from that. Um, and we apologize that we can't that we can't share that. This is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined this morning by Jonathan Kramer. He's an artist and inventor and the sculptor of the We Are statue. So Jonathan, we'd like to have a little bit of fun here on coffee hour at the end and what we call our lightning round. So I'm gonna throw just a couple quick hitter questions at you and see what your reaction is. So your favorite Penn State memory. Um, my favorite Penn State memory happened once every, once a year. It was basically when the weather broke. <laughs> when it became spring and you could walk around the campus in shorts and just like that energy it wasn't a specific thing just in this incredible amazing energy of, of learning and having fun there's this phenomena that happens after months of temperatures in the 30s and below yeah. it gets close to 50 and students are outside in shorts uh, yep it's, it's still <laughs> about 10 or 15 degrees too cold to be in shorts but it, that's that's kind of the line of demarcation in the semester, right? For sure. How about your favorite class at Penn State? Um, I think they're like two, they're, my work with Helen O'Leary, um, the painter um, that is our great Penn State painter. I was her assistant um, and it was a class that was constructed basically um, to learn the 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 real art of classical painting and and also to um, support another artist you, you can only learn by assisting a master so I would you know make great uh, stretchers and and um, gesso and she was so generous um, Professor O'Leary to allow me into the her process to to show me by allowing me to work and help her with her craft so you know there was that um, and then also the um, my African art history classes, and also Professor James Woods biological anthropology, man, that really changed my life. That's great. How about if you could have dinner with anyone, who would it be and why? Oh wow! Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, this is going to sound corny, but yeah. it would be my wife Natalie and my daughter Nova. Because we love eating and cooking together and we go around to the farms and we know we're eating food that our friends grow and we grow food and it's a, such a amazing experience uh, for me every you know and I love cooking so that's the obvious answer for me but of course there's you know 
so many people out there it's overwhelming but that's my first Absolutely. answer <laughs> jonathan how about your most unusual we are moment where did you hear we are where it kind of caught you off guard or you didn't expect to run into another penn stater oh wow i mean there's actually a lot of them i'm sorry i'm not being so specific but that's okay I mean, just being in new york city or being in a city or being or traveling and you see somebody with like they say we are, or you see a right, sticker right. or something, you know, you can, you can go over and, and go, you know, thumbs up or go and say hello. And it's just kind of like, wow, we really have this community here spread across the globe. How cool. So it's well, not I'm, one again, but many, many, many things. Well, I'm going to share a we are story with you that involves you. So um, I got a call. This is probably, I don't know, back in the fall. Um, a friend of ours and and a great volunteer for Penn State, John Brooks, and his wife Emily, went hiking in the Catskills, and and they're they're hiking up there one day, and they're going down the path, and coming the other way down the path, is another Penn Stater, and they say we are, and the Penn Stater says Penn State back to them, or it might have been the other way around, and that Penn Stater was you. They they went on to tell me about how they met the sculptor of the We Are statue. When they were at a when they were vacationing in the Catskills and just happened to run into you in the woods uh, out on a hike one day. Yeah, just another Penn Stater, really. Absolutely, Jonathan. Your favorite Penn State sport? Um, gosh, I've seen so many of them. I feel it's like I like so many different um, things that I'm. You're. You're. I'm, it's hard for me to give you specifics. Of course, like. Just, you know, I remember the years when like the women's volleyball team would like crush it. And it was like anytime we like so many different teams would like do something great or like when the wrestlers would do it. Of course, like football is so exciting. Um, it's gosh, it's um, it just even I am sports, you know, like it's just right. all it's all really awesome. Even hockey now. And I mean, there's so much. It's absolutely it's, it's great. Absolutely. I answer that question. Um, I, I, I say whatever season we're in. There you go. Is, is my favorite Penn State sport. How about your favorite flavor of Creamery ice cream? Oh, wow. You know, um, there's so many. There's so many good ones. I'm trying to remember. You know, honestly, I would get the uh, cheese curds that they made. Oh. You know what I mean? They, because I would right. be studying at the studio late at night and I and I'd need a snack, you know, like a high protein snack and something good for you. And I, I would, if I just ate the ice cream, all, you know, problems, right. it's like all, all of the ice cream is absolutely delicious. I mean, I get some every time I'm there, but the, the, the other stuff on the side is really awesome. You know, sometimes they even have shiitake mushrooms and they have these yeah. amazing cheese curds. I mean, it's so cool. The creamery in general is awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of hidden gems in the creamery. My son Aiden works at the creamery and he's always bringing home cheese curds and different flavors and all oh, the new know. things that the things that we didn't know uh, were produced by the creamery besides ice cream, right? It's there just, you uh, go. Yeah. A different surprise uh, each week. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us on, on coffee hour and for allowing us to share your story. It's a, it's a story of, of passion and inspiration and, and know that, um, we, we love the statue. It is an iconic Thank landmark you. at our, at our institution. Um, and it's something that thousands and thousands of people travel to each year to have their photo taken with. And so you, your life continues to swell by fame of dear old state. Um, well, I, I just have a lot of love for Penn state and I'm glad to be a part of it. I'm glad to be an alumni that's part of the fabric here. Um, and if my contributions can bring us together even more, well, that, that surely is good. And I thank you. Well, and thank you for joining us. And thank everybody who's watching on Facebook Live or here in the Zoom room. We appreciate you tuning in to Coffee Hour. If you're a member of the Alumni Association, thank you so much for your support. If you're not, what are you waiting for? Go to our website at alumni.psu.edu and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. Also, make sure you go out to Barnes & Noble uh, website, the Penn State Bookstore, and see and get all the information about how you can put a We Are statue, the seven-inch version of the We Are statue, 
in your home. Thank you for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are. We are.